Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Before I get going here, I have a bit of a, a, an announcement I forgot. Uh, just that for the members here, when you receive your communion, you'll come up, receive it, and go around the church this way. Our, common, our cups are disposable, so you can throw them away, and the ushers will release you pew by pew. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our text comes from the gospel, just read to you a moment ago, where Jesus promises to give us comfort by sending us the Holy Spirit. There was a young lady who went into a bookstore, and she went and she picked out a book that was somewhat popular and well-known, and she sat down to read it, and she read a, a couple pages of it, and you might have had the same experience in your life. Um, it was dull. It was boring. She didn't want to read it anymore. Now, I know some people will gut through it and read a book that they find uninteresting, but after a while, a lot of us would just quit on it, and she did. She quit on the book, put it on the shelf, and forgot all about it. End of that. Move on with life. Two or three years later, she was at an event and she met the author of the book. They started dating. They fell in love. They got married. And now when you ask her about that book, she says it's one of the best books ever written. Full of passion and love. And there is nothing dull about that book. And she would argue it with any one of you. It is because... Something had changed. The words were the same. The author was the same. But now she's using love to interpret the book she was reading. And it made all the difference. So it is for us Christians. We, wear, we hear the word of God. We hear the Bible. We hear the letters and the words of Jesus himself. And when we hear them, to us, that sacred, pure, comforting word, is true. The world does not know the Holy Spirit, but we do. The Holy Spirit dwells in us, and so now we can hear the Word of God with our mind and our heart and our soul, and we are comforted, and we believe, and we even keep the Word of God. Verse 15 is a very strange verse. In fact, it's so strange, in fact, I went back and I had a look at the verb in Greek and I announced in the last two services, by the way, that I'd never look at Greek. So I had to ask for forgiveness from the bishop for not preparing my sermons appropriately. And two services so far is yet to forgive me. I'm hoping for this one. But it is true. This is the words of Jesus himself. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That little will is interesting to me. There's no gray area in it. There's no wiggle room. There's no some days you will and some days you won't. Some moments you will and some moments you won't. Either Jesus is telling the truth or he is lying, and I'm going with the truth. He tells us that you and I, brothers and sisters in Christ, we do, we will keep his commandments because we love Christ. And that we do. Shock. Little Johnny was, uh, uh, um, well, he wasn't evil. He wasn't good. We have all sorts of nice words for children like that. <laughs> Difficult, impish, he'll find his way. Um, I know those words because I heard them growing up myself. But little Johnny, he did not like to sit still in preschool or kindergarten or first or second grade for that matter. And Johnny did not like listening to his teachers. And he would not share either. He did like finger painting, but I think it was the mess that he made that drove everyone crazy. I think he enjoyed that. But his mother always spoke well of him, no matter what. And she always lifted him up, no matter what. And no one was allowed to run down Johnny when his mother was in the earshot of the conversation. It was so bad, in fact, that all the other mothers thought that maybe Johnny's mother was a little 
um, not right in the head. Because it was very obvious who Johnny was. So one day, Johnny's mother was talking to another mother. And Johnny's mother admitted to it. She goes, look, I know what my son does. I really do. But Johnny needs to know two things in this world. One is that no matter what, and I mean no matter what, Johnny's mother loves Johnny. And number two is this, that she had decided long ago to focus on Johnny's good, what he does right, and not what he does wrong. God's not ignorant. He knows who we are. But he probably knows more of who you are than even you know who you are. Because Jesus did take away your sins. You have been made pure. You are righteous. You are the children of God. You do wear the white robes. You have been made right and perfect. You are the saints of God today. So how does God look at us? Righteous and pure. And he sees us as people who keeps his commandment, who loves the Lord their God with all their heart and with all their mind and loves their neighbors as yourself. That is who we are. Shocking evenly so. Our humility does not allow us to talk that way. That's fine. But know this. God does talk that way about you and me. We love God. We keep his commandments. I know that because I've seen your love manifest. And I know it because Jesus says so. But how can this be? Well, Jesus understood that the question would be difficult. In fact, the problem is the road that we have to walk as Christians is just about, well, I take it back. It is impossible until we receive the helper, the Holy Spirit. That's an interesting Phrase, an interesting title, an interesting way of describing the third person of the Holy Trinity, the helper. And each time we say we love Jesus, we speak it because the helper has helped us do it. And without the helper, we're lost. He lives in us. He gives us faith, sustains our faith. We are not alone in this world. Not now, not ever. You could be cut off from the people of God. You could go Sunday after Sunday not enjoying worship because of pandemics and disease or even age, and yet you're still not alone. I'm a big fan of uh, Victorian English men who go to Africa. I love those stories. They're, they're very interesting. And the most famous of them is a missionary named Dr. Livingstone. And 16 years he spent in Africa. And when he came back, his alma mater came and said, would you speak to the student body? And he did. And when he got up to speak, his face was all worn out from 16 years in Africa. In parts in Africa that had never seen anyone outside of its tribe, who had never heard about Jesus. He went into those places. And his body was worn out from fever and disease. And one of his arms was disabled because a lion attacked it and literally chewed on his arm. Now that's a mission field. Could you imagine that on call day? Oh, by the way, you might be worried there's a few lions involved. Oh, you mean people who don't treat the pastor right? No, I mean actual big cats with big teeth growling. But the students asked him in the Q&A section, what kept you going? Lo, I will be with you always to the ends of the earth, to quote Jesus. He was never alone. He was never without God. He was never without his helper. God is with us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are not alone. We are not lost. We have the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And that is where he lives. God doesn't live in stone and silver and gold and even in a building, per se, God lives, he lives in your heart. Even when we utter those beautiful words, I love you, Jesus, it's because we have to have the helper. 
and this should bring you great comfort, that faith is so important that God has not left you on your own. You need the helper. Without it, there is no faith. You need the helper. Without it, your faith will not be sustained. The Holy Spirit is there to help you, to love you, to guide you, to bring you through this life to the next. And boy, do we need a helper. I mean, God does know what he's doing. He saw us people and said, boy, these people are going to need help. And normally I say I speak for myself, but really I'm speaking for all Christians. We really do need the helper. God is very good at what he does. He gives his church what it needs in season and out. And the Holy Spirit, the helper, has been from Pentecost onwards there. But when we look at the church, we look at ourselves and we look at each other, we think to ourselves, at least the pastors do, this isn't going to work. The church is surely going to fall apart. Between the external and the internal demands within the church and the sinful nature of human being, churches will not exist. We'll, we'll just tear ourselves apart. I, I, even now, I, I still think, I think God... You started off with the mistake of calling me to be a pastor. There's your first mistake, and that's the beginning of it. And yet God looks at us and goes, not only that, you're the pastor. This is the church you're going to have, and these are your people. It shouldn't work. A research psychologist did a very interesting study. He did a survey of world-class orchestras and symphonies. Now, has anyone in here been in orchestra or symphony in high school, junior high, college? Raise your hand. I want to see who you are. Okay. So, for you'll really get this. The rest of us, we'll get it. But you'll, if you're in that group, you're going to love this. So, he asked each, each person about what they thought of the other sections of the orchestra. So, first off, he compiled what... The or everyone in the orchestra thought of the percussionists. They were intense, but they were hard of hearing, unintelligent, but fun-loving. Strings were arrogant, stuffy, and unathletic. Brass had one word, by the way. Loud! That's brass. Woodwoods were quiet, meticulous, and egocentric, but they also had the most positives given to them. How does a group of people who think that way about the other groups around them make those beautiful music? How do they make it all happen? And what they found out is very quite simple. They only have one conductor. That's all it is. That conductor will pull them all together. Our church has one God, one head. It is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He what holds us together. He's what puts us in the same page. He's what moves the church forward. Of course, in human hands, we would destroy the church. But it's not in human hands. It's in God's hand. And there is success and only success. In season and out. In times where we worship only online. Times where we worship with just a few. And times when our churches are packed. It matters not. God is still in charge in every way. How does faith come about? It is the work of the helper. And how is it sustained? It is the work of the helper. Do not take credit for God's work. Just thank Him for it. It's a lot easier. Trust me on this. We are one with God, in fact. Our text makes this very clear. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our text makes almost this comforting level, Jesus takes it to a, almost a shocking end. We are now... We are now part of God's family. In fact, the Holy Spirit now lives in you. We need a helper. Oh, do we need a helper. And boy, did we get one. One way beyond what we could ever imagine. Why is these verses considered comforting? It's because we have been promised and now we have received the helper. And how much does God love us? 
look, I think there's a lot of little Johnny in all of us if we're very honest about the situation. But God sent the helper to sustain and to build faith. And yes, God's not naive, but when he sees you, when he looks at you, and how he knows you is this, his children who love him and keep his command. That's who you are. May the certainty that God's love is in your heart through the work of the Holy Spirit. May the certainty that your faith given and sustained and will pull you for the rest of your life is a gift God gives, and it's a good gift. May the certainty that you are part of his family bring you comfort and peace during this difficult season we find ourselves in. In Jesus' name, amen.